I'm Matt McClure, and this is Currents. Preparations for the beatification of John Paul II kick into high gear. A leading Vatican watcher gives us an up-close look. Plus, a local seminarian talks about the impact the late pontiff had on his life and vocation. For me, personally, he's a great example and he's someone who uh, I use as a role model for my future priesthood. And you may think Easter has come and gone, but think again. Bishop DiMarzio goes into the deep to explain. The celebration continues actually to Pentecost when we celebrate the coming of the Holy Spirit. Well, good evening. Thanks so much for joining us. Well, it is almost here. Pope Benedict will beatify his predecessor, John Paul II, less than two days from now. On Sunday morning, the pontiff who served more than 26 years as the head of the Catholic Church will become blessed John Paul II. Well, the Vatican has been preparing for the ceremony for months, even years really if you think about it, but now the preparations have kicked into high gear. And we wanted to get an up close and personal look at what's going on in Rome as the beatification draws closer. So earlier today, I spoke with someone who watches the Holy See's every move. He's Rocco Palmo, author of the blog Whispers in the Loggia and a Currents contributor. We spoke by phone earlier today. Rocco Palmo, thanks so much for, much for joining us from Rome. We appreciate your time very much. Anytime, buonasera, Matt. <laughs> Thank you. I get in the spirit of things. You know, when in Rome... Um, Say grazie. <laughs> when, when in Rome, literally. Um, so since you are in Rome, tell us a little bit about what's happening right now, uh, where you are and what you've seen so far since you've been there. Well, suffice it to say the buzz is building. Uh, yes, I got here yesterday morning. There were a bit of crowds around, but today it's spiked up exponentially over, over what it was. Uh, and tomorrow, you know, with the weekend and, and above all with four-day holiday weekend in Poland for the beatification, uh, it's, it's going to be like you're swimming through people to try and get around here. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine. What, what uh, as far as preparations that are taking place, I'm sure those have all kind of switched into high gear now, getting ready for those crowds. What, what's happening as far as that goes? Well, massive security operation went into place on Sunday. A lot of the train lines, a lot of the, um, uh, you know, a lot of central ro traffic in most of central Rome is going to be shut down on Sunday. You won't be able to drive a car. Um, but also, uh, this morning, the body of John Paul II was removed from its tomb in the Vatican grottoes beneath St. Peter's Basilica and was brought upstairs. Uh, it's going to be, it's not going to be opened or anything, but it's going to be there for the veneration of the people on Sunday. And then um, on Sunday night, it's going to be placed in its new tomb on the main floor of St. Peter's. Only one other modern pope has that distinction, John the Twenty-Third, who was beatified by John Paul II in 2000. Uh, so beyond that, you've got, uh, you know, I mean, Italian TV, the Italians are asking, what royal wedding? <laughs> you know, John Paul II, clips of John Paul II were running on TV all morning uh, with triumphal music, his greatest hits, if you will. And uh, I was really intrigued by the fact that Archbishop Reno Fisichella, head of the uh, Vatican office dedicated to the new evangelization, was actually guest anchoring one of the Italian morning shows. So Rome's a company town, but we're really seeing that in these days. Yeah, yeah. All, all we've heard over here uh, on, on this side of the pond, as it were, would be uh, all about the royal wedding so far. But uh, that, I imagine, is, is kind of going to change just a little bit. Have, have you seen um, any dignitaries uh, there just yet? Uh, any uh, people, any, any church officials who wouldn't normally be in Rome right now oh, yet? I, yeah, well, it's funny. I went bird watching this afternoon and looking for cardinals out in the streets around the <laughs> Vatican. So um, uh, I saw the Archbishop of Warsaw yesterday and uh, accompanied by a delegation of around 10, and he was in his cassock, and so you had Swiss guards saluting all over the place. But by contrast, this afternoon while I was sitting out having lunch with a friend, uh, I saw Cardinal Oscar Rodriguez Maradiaga, the uh, cardinal from Tegucigalpa, Honduras, who was anything but in his finery, didn't have a chain on, was only, you know, I knew him from his face, but, uh, you know, he walked into a restaurant and you know, someone said, uh, buongiorno, monsignore, thinking he was just a simple priest or monsignor. So, uh, you know, they come in all shapes and sizes around here, Matt. You know, and uh, I mean, not many of the American bishops and American priests will be over because, one, it's a longer trip, but also for the American bishops, it's confirmation season. And so a lot of the bishops here couldn't get out of that. So I mean, they're going to be, there already are, I've seen a lot of American pilgrims around, but again, above all, they're from Poland. You see Polish flags everywhere and literally busloads, groups of, you know, 50, 60, 100 Poles kind of going on tours before the big day Sunday. 
Sure. Now, you talked about the movement of the body of, of John Paul already. Give us a little bit more of a preview, if you will, of what's going to happen um, between now and Sunday. Well, t again, tomorrow is kind of, you know, the, the major hordes of the crowds are expected to come in. You know, every hotel in Rome is booked. The airfares from the states, I know, doubled and even tripled uh, leading up to this. Tomorrow night, there's going to be a vigil down at the Circus Maximus, which, you know, I mean, a striking setting. And uh, it's going to include two speeches, three speeches, actually. One from John Paul's longtime private secretary of 40 years, now Cardinal Stanislav Zivish, uh, who succeeded him, went back to Poland as Archbishop of Krakow after John Paul's death. And then uh, Joaquin Navarro Valls, who many, some may remember as being John Paul's, you know, bullfighting Spanish spokesman uh, in his uh, reign. And also uh, Sister Marie St. Pierre. Uh, Sister Marie St. Pierre is a French nun who's healing from Parkinson's disease was the miracle that got John Paul beatified. Mm. So uh, it's going to be very moving, and then a new hymn is going to be sung, Open Wide the Doors to Christ, which comes from John Paul's inaugural homily. Uh, and that's actually the homily, the, the, the text that's going to be used for him every year on his feast day, which is October 22nd, not the date of his death, which of course is April 2nd, but it's the anniversary of his, uh, his uh, inauguration as Pope. One more thing, too, Matt. You know, Sunday, uh, people are saying, well, why have it at the end of Easter week and, you know, all of this? Uh, because you have to remember, in 2005, John Paul II died on Easter Saturday. And above all, it was the Feast of the Divine Mercy, which, you know, a Polish uh, a revelation to a Polish nun, now St. Faustina Kowalska, who, which was John Paul's favorite devotion, and which he gave equal billing to the second Sunday of Easter. Well, this Sunday, the day of the beatification, is that second Sunday of Easter, Divine Mercy Sunday. So it's kind of poetic that six years later in, in record time, here we are to see him beatified. Absolutely. Well, Rocco Palmo, we will uh, stay in touch with you over in Rome, and we'll talk to you again on Sunday. We really appreciate your time today. Thanks. A anytime. Buona notte. Thanks. And we will talk to Rocco once again on Sunday during our extensive coverage of the beatification right here on NET, so tune in for that. Well, there's more current straight ahead. President Obama surveys the damage in the storm-ravaged South. That story and the rest of the day's headlines next. Welcome back to Currents. I'm Matt McClure. Coming up later, a loyal Currents viewer dropped us a line to tell us how she feels about Pope John Paul II. So stay tuned for that. But first, let's have a look at the day's headlines. Well, it has been two days now and survivors are still stunned at the devastation wrought by deadly tornadoes that tore across six southern states. People continue to pray and mourn the loss of loved ones. The storms claimed more than 300 lives and literally wiped neighborhoods off the map. Today, President Obama visited Alabama, the state that suffered the highest death toll, and said that gov the government will be there to help. Tuscaloosa typically gets uh, a tornado uh, during the season, uh, but this is something that I don't think anybody's seen before. Uh, in addition to uh, keeping all the families who've been affected in our thoughts and prayers, uh, obviously our biggest priority now uh, is to help this community recover. The tornadoes hit particularly hard in the area covered by the Diocese of Birmingham, and we spoke with someone earlier today who told us that although neighborhoods have been reduced to rubble, no parishes have reported damage so far. A new government report adds Egypt to the list of the top 14 worst violators of religious rights. The report from the United States Commission on International Religious Freedom says the situation for religious minorities in that country has deteriorated, particularly for Coptic Christians. Among other countries that made the list, China, Iran, Iraq, Nigeria, North Korea, and Pakistan. Well, the North American branch of the Christian Brothers has filed for bankruptcy amid a growing number of sexual abuse claims against members of the religious community. Reuters reports that the Christian Brothers have already paid out more than $25 million to settle over 50 abuse claims. According to a lawyer, most of the claims are from the Seattle area. The Christian brothers are known around the world for their work in the field of education. A priest accused of stealing more than a million dollars from his parish has been sentenced to three years in jail. Father Kevin Gray of the Archdiocese of Hartford pleaded no contest to charges that he stole the money. Reports say Gray spent it on male escorts, Armani clothing, and a Manhattan apartment. A lawyer for the priest says the charges were overblown. Well, he is back. Controversial Protestant pastor Terry Jones is making headlines again. 
Jones arrived yesterday ahead of his planned protest outside City Hall in the town of Dearborn, Michigan. Jones says the city, along with Wayne County, violated his civil rights last week when they stopped him from holding a protest outside one of the country's largest mosques. Jones first made, the headline, made headlines last year when he threatened to burn the Quran on the anniversary of September 11th. He eventually backed down from those plans. Last month, though, he put the Islamic holy book on a mock trial and burned it. Well, it was the wedding of the century, and by all accounts, the world was watching. Britain's Prince William married Kate Middleton at a lavish ceremony at Westminster Abbey in London, England today. I'm sure you've heard about it. Police say a million people lined the wedding route, and estimates say as many as two billion, with a B, people tuned in on television. A handful of Catholic officials from the UK attended the ceremony, including Irish Cardinal Sean Brady, the first senior official in the Irish Church to attend a British royal function. Well, ahead of the beatification of John Paul II, de developer Little iApps has released a Blessed John Paul II app. It's part of a series of apps in Catholic, on Catholic Church figures. Other apps released so far, St. Joseph and St. Jana. Unlike those two apps, though, the John Paul app is being offered free of charge. And you know, it may not be the original, but it's the next best thing. Ahead of Sunday's beatification, the website UCA News reports that pilgrims are flocking to the Philippines and a replica of the boyhood home of John Paul II. The soon-to-be beatified pontiff grew up in Poland, of course, but the replica is situated on the grounds of the parish of the National Shrine of Divine Mercy in the town of Mar Marialo. Now, there is a statue of John Paul that sits outside that house, and photos inside trace his life from his childhood to his death. The next best thing indeed. Stay with us. There's much more currents ahead. Coming up, Easter is upon us. Still, I go into the deep with Bishop DiMarzio to talk about it. All the importance of our faith comes from uh, the resurrection. And St. Paul told us our faith would be in vain if it were not that Christ rose from the dead. Welcome back and allow me to wish you a happy Easter. No, I don't think it's Sunday, April 24th, and, and no, I'm not trying to be fashionably late either. I'm wishing you a happy Easter. I'm just gonna sit here and do that. And yes, in fact, I can do so for the next 44 days. Why, you may ask, have I lost my mind? No, uh, it's because Easter is actually a season. It's not just one day. It's a season that lasts for 50 days and ends with the celebration of Pentecost Sunday. So how have I become such an expert on Easter? Well, I waded into the deep with Bishop Nicholas DiMarzio recently to talk about it. Well, Bishop, thanks so much for being here again. We appreciate it. Good to be here. Well, um, uh, a little pop quiz for you as we start off here. What <laughs> is the, uh, didn't know you were gonna get quizzed. When you right, did. right. Um, what is the bigger celebration uh, for the Catholic Church, Christmas or Easter and why? Well, Easter is, because it is the central mystery of our faith. Yes, if Christ wasn't born, he couldn't have died and rose, but the fact is that he, he died and rose from the dead. So Easter is the central mystery, the Paschal mystery as we call it. Uh, and all, everything flows from that, all the importance of our faith comes from uh, the resurrection, and St. Paul told us our faith would be in vain if it were not that Christ rose from the dead. There you go. Well, um, what, um, on, on Easter Sunday, I guess a lot of people probably have this impression that, okay, we celebrated Easter Sunday, well, Easter's over with now, but that's not quite the case, right? No, we continue the celebration of Easter for the Sundays after Easter, and uh, meditating on the mystery with the Gospels that portray Christ after he was resurrected. Uh, so the, the, the celebration continues actually to Pentecost when we celebrate the coming of the Holy Spirit. Sure. Well, um, of course, Lent was this season, which we've just now exited, of somber reflection. No alleluia during the, the season and, and so on and so forth. Now, uh, of course, the Easter season is a season of celebration. How are people going to notice things that are going to be quite different, a little, little bit brighter in, uh, in Mass? Well, I think we see from the churches how they're decorated, uh, the, the plants, the, the candles, the, the singing. You know, we are singing Alleluia uh, after Easter, and we're, we give praise to God for that great mystery, and it's just a more solemn and joyful time than uh, Lent was. Sure, sure. 
Well, uh, of course, the 40 days of uh, Lent did lead us to, to Easter, as we just said. What does, does Easter ultimately lead us to? You talked about Pentecost. Now we're kind of working toward that. Um, tell us a little bit about this, the, the journey that we're on leading up to, to well, that Well, now Pentecost is 50 days after Easter. It, it re reminds us of the, the time that was best spent. Christ was still uh, with us uh, till that till his ascension. And then uh, th we w they awaited another 10 days for the coming of the Holy Spirit. And uh, the Holy Spirit, again, gives life to the church. It's the birth of the church. It's the time we're in now from the Pentecost on is, is the present time. Mm. So it is uh, that mystery of how the church is born uh, from the side of Christ who died on the cross, that blood and water flowed out, and that's what, how the church was born. That was actually the birth of the church. We don't think of that all the time. We do celebrate it at Pentecost. Sure, sure. Very important time uh, in, <coughs> in the, the Christian faith here. Of course, a lot, I, you know, I'm, I'm from the South, as you know, and a big part of uh, our Easter celebrations are always the food. And I uh, mm. you know you from uh, from an Italian family as yeah. well. Food is always a big part of the celebration. Right. <laughs> what uh, what are maybe some of your, uh, your favorite Easter memories uh, of food or celebrations with family? <sighs> Well, certainly food is a big part of Easter, the, the Easter breads and lasagna or with special pastas and uh, l lamb, you know, uh, that's traditional for remembering the Paschal lamb, and so many people do uh, roast lamb at Easter. So it, it's, it's very interesting to, to see the various traditions. And now it, uh, one of my nieces married to Ukrainian fellas, so they have their own Easter traditions. and. Uh, so we kind of combine them. Usually they host Easter for us. So we go down there and uh, so we got Italian and Irish and Ukrainian and <coughs> a couple of other uh, ethnicities mix up there. But uh, it's one Easter. I love it. I love it. Absolutely. <laughs> well, you know, in, in my family, it was like, you know, fried chicken, mashed potatoes and that kind of thing. <laughs> because I'm from the South. <laughs> but, uh, anyway, Bishop DiMarzio, yeah. thanks so much for being here. You're we welcome. It. Okay. I don't know which I'm hungrier for now, uh, lasagna, pasta, lamb, fried chicken, mashed potatoes. Maybe I'll have it all. If I have a huge plate of food when we come back, you'll know I've d Bishop DiMarzio made me hungry. Stay tuned, there's more currents ahead. When we return, a look back at the life of John Paul through the eyes of someone preparing for the priesthood. John Paul II, definitely, I know for me, is a great example of what I want to be in the future. And finally tonight, you know, it may come as a surprise to you that the man who took so naturally to the priesthood and would one day become an enormously popular pope had to study for the priesthood in secret. Despite German occupation of Poland during World War II, then seminarian Karol Wojtyla began his priesthood studies at a secret seminary run by the Archbishop of Krakow. From these secretive beginnings, Pope John Paul II would go on to lead a life that would inspire generations. That's definitely the case for Carlos Velazquez. He's a seminarian for the Diocese of Brooklyn, and his is the story of a young man who always knew he would be a priest and looked to Pope John Paul as his model. Pope John Paul II was a great example for Catholics and non-Catholics alike. For Catholics, definitely, he was the prime example of what it meant to be a true Christian, a true Catholic. He was a very, very holy man, very, very gentle soul, and it emanated from him in everything that he did. He became Pope immediately after the death of Pope John Paul I, who unfortunately died uh, after only about 30 days as Pope. And so a few months later, all the cardinals came back together and they elected John Paul II. There was no hint as to it being him because he was from Poland, from a far off land. Normally, popes came from the surrounding dioceses in Italy. It had been a few hundred years since uh, a pope wasn't from Italy. He was a great traveler. He went to so many nations. I think it was uh, somewhere over 120 countries that he traveled to throughout his entire papacy. He brought Jesus, he brought the gospel to so many lands, to so many people. You know, talk about a big scare. Out comes the Holy Father for one of his general audiences, which was very common, and he got shot. He was in 
surgery for about five hours afterward. After the assassination attempt, almost the entire world saw him as a hero. I think it was very important. One of the great things that he did was after his surgery, after his full recovery, he went and he visited the man in jail and he offered him his forgiveness to someone who tried to kill him. John Paul II saw a need and saw that the future of the church is in the youth. And he established what is now called World Youth Day. And it is amazing the thousands and the thousands of young people that would get together just to be with the Holy Father, just to catch a glimpse of the Holy Father, just to see him. Toward the end of, of Pope John Paul II's life, it was very obvious that he was in extreme suffering. I can remember being in high school and, you know, it being announced that the Holy Father had died. And there was just this sense of extreme sadness and extreme sorrow that this person whom we had loved for so long, he was Pope for almost 27 years. I mean, to me, he was the only Pope that I ever knew. Thousands upon thousands of people flocked to the Vatican for days to see him, just to see him, again, just for the one last time, to pay their respects to this man who had been such a great influence to all of us and who had played such a big role in the church throughout his papacy. The Vatican was filled with young people. The lines outside of the Vatican waiting to get into St. Peter's Basilica were filled with people who were there to pay their respects to this man who loved them so much. People would chant, Santo Subito, Saint now, Saint fast, you know. Uh, they wanted the Vatican to acknowledge the holiness in this man. They saw it throughout his entire life that he was genuinely a saint. Looking into my future ministry as a priest, uh, he's, he's an excellent example for me, you know. You have to be a genuine person. You have to be a man of God. You have to be a holy man. You have to be someone who opens your arms out to everyone who comes to you. And definitely, I think, for me personally, he's a great example, and he's someone who uh, I use as a role model for my future priesthood, um, someone who loved everyone who he came in contact with. As a priest, we have to know how to do that. As a Christian, we have to know how to do that, how to love all of our brothers and sisters and all those who come in contact with us. And John Paul II, definitely, I know for me, is a great example of what I want to be in the future, a good and a holy priest, and please God, one day a saint. Well, tonight we're also privileged to share the thoughts of a current viewer who decided to drop us a line. It comes courtesy of Janie from Maspeth, and she actually wrote in to tell us this. She said, quote, I think Pope John Paul II is already a saint. To me, he does not have to perform any kind of miracle. Who in their lifetime will forgive someone who shoots them? I sometimes cannot forgive someone who does something minor. To me, Pope John Paul loved everyone. She went on to say, quote, I never got to see him in person, but he was in Queens in 1995 at the time my dad passed away, and it made me feel that my dad was in heaven and he was in peace when I watched coverage of Pope John Paul. I feel that he was a saint on earth and should definitely be declared a saint now that he is in heaven. Well, thank you, Janie, for sharing your words with us. And why don't you join her and you share your memories of the beloved Pope with us, too? Uh, we'll even make it easy for you. All you have to do is drop us a line. As a matter of fact, our email address is dropusaline at currentsny.net. See, a real person really does get the emails. It's right here. And uh, we would love to see yours in our inbox. And we would share your thoughts on the air right here during our ongoing beatification coverage. So just drop us a line. And also, don't touch your dial or press the button on your remote, because coming up next, exclusively on NET, we bring you John Paul II, The Pope Who Made History. It's a unique series that tells the story of the life, times, and legacy of Pope John Paul. Be sure to watch right here next at 8 p.m. And make sure to tune in tomorrow for a special edition of Currents dedicated entirely to the soon-to-be blessed John Paul II. That's coming up tomorrow night at 7.30. Until then, for all of us here at Currents, I'm Matt McClure. Thanks so much for watching and have a great night.